Hi, American Butcher here, also known as Travis. Welcome to The Meat Block, episode number eight, grass-fed beef and rotating your pasture. In this episode, David is going to answer a couple questions, one about his preference of grass-fed beef uh, versus corn-fed, get into the flavors, why it tastes the way it does, more of the science about the omega-3s and omega-6s, and then talking about rotating your pastures. Uh, Dabble a little bit in uh, the conversation about farm setting, but that's a huge topic and deserves this entire show. I'll be back at the end for some liner notes, but until then, remember. Parental discretion's advised. Good cutting enhances the quality of good meat. In his way, the meat cutter is an artist. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. Question comes from the old meatballer via Instagram, and he's asking me um, about my preferences when it comes to grass-fed versus grain-fed red meat. I'm probably going to catch some flack for this one, I suppose, Um, because everybody feels really passionately one way or the other. I'll tell you, I I grew up in Michigan, um, and I grew up on grain-fed beef, and I liked it just fine until I was older and I ate grass-fed. And I'll just go out there and say I prefer grass-fed beef, and I prefer grass-fed lamb, Um, hands down. And there's a multitude of reasons. Um, I think I just, you know, I prefer the the taste of a ruminant... um, that's been raised on grass. I think that, that it's got a better flavor. Um, I think that it tastes more minerally. I think that, um, the texture ends up being better. I think that the fat is more evenly dispersed, you know, a ton of animals, mostly beef, but definitely mutton and lamb that come through the slaughterhouse that are, um, raised on grain, especially finished on grain. I find that their fat just is, is really packed on and starts to encroach into the meat and, um, isn't evenly distributed well. So, you know, you get a ribeye with a giant, giant eye of fat in the center. And and um, I just think that's kind of wasteful, you know, because I, I, I don't enjoy just eating a giant knob of fat by itself. Um, I like it to be a little bit more evenly marbled throughout the meat. And I find that a, a long-term grass-fed animal that has proper pasture, that's high in legumes, high in protein, high in omega-3 fatty acids in their diet is going to have a way better marble. You know, the, the place that Travis and I worked up in Washington, they had grass-fed, grass-finished beef. We'd slaughter 28 to 32 months, and I'm telling you, some of them were almost prime. The fat was so beautifully dispersed throughout the, the muscle fibers. You know, I, I see a ton of animals come through that are grain fed where I work now. Um, a lot of burned out milkers. There's a, there's a large dairy industry around me. And I got to say that the animals that come through that are grain fed bar none have the lion's share of the health issues. Um, you know, diabetes, inflammation, arthritis in the joints, uh, ruminitis, various infections, you know, pneumonia. I see a lot on, um, grain fed animals. I think it's, it's just, it inhibits the immune system of these animals. They weren't, you know, ruminants were not ever meant to eat grain. They just weren't. And the way that their stomachs and their digestive system works, it takes a really long time for them to adjust. They never really fully do. I'm I'm sure you've heard of bloat and acidosis and various, um, ailments that happen with ruminants that eat grain. And I think it's, it's really an immune system suppressor for them. Um, especially with how quickly they pack on fat in an unnatural way. I think that you have a lot of animals that, uh, you know, it's like, it's just like people, you know, people that just eat fast food and bread and cookies and crackers and sweets and bread and sugar and sugar and sugar. Well, they're fat and lazy and unhealthy and pale and pasty. And if I was a cannibal, I sure as shit wouldn't want to eat those people. I'd want to eat the people that were eating a well-balanced diet of vegetables and, and protein and were in good shape, you know? And the same goes for animals. Um, when it comes to flavor, there's a lot of people out there that that mistake a couple of things for being gamey. First of all, I hear all the time grass fed beef tastes gamey. I hear um, let's let's tackle that first. So the taste of grass is not gamey at all. 
uh, the taste of game is much, much different. And while the taste of game oftentimes, unless we're talking about something to do with tarsal glands, the taste of game really has to do with a wild animal's diet. And that's a lot of times going to be wild legumes, acorns, sage, uh, various things that that you know venison and elk will find. Um, I know the best time to, to shoot a bear is during berry season. In Washington, they go up in the mountains and they eat berries, and the meat is really sweet and it's and it's less gamey. Grass is is the flavor of the diet. So you've got grass fed beef that tastes very minerally. There's a lot of iron in it. It has a different fat profile than grain fed beef. Uh, grass fed beef tends to have four to five times higher omega three fatty acids and the same amount of omega six. So you've got a much better balance of the fatty acids you're looking for, and that that has a lot to do with the flavor. The corn fed Beef, you know, personally, when I'm when I'm in the slaughterhouse, I'm on the kill floor, and, and I I can smell the difference between a grass fed beef and a grain fed beef, and the grain fed beef just smells sour. It smells it smells off, and 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 that bacteria that E. coli that uh, unhealthy gut flora just emanates from them, and and you know, just ask most people on a kill floor, you can tell the difference just by smelling them when they come in. I get a lot of people that say that lamb tastes gamey. Lamb also, mutton also, does not taste gamey. That's a very different flavor. Uh, Lamb and mutton taste the way that they do because they have a particular type of uh, fat in them. So they've got lanolin in their system, and um, they've got a particular type of fatty acid called a branched chain fatty acid, and that's particular to sheep, and beef doesn't have it, and that's that's where that comes from. A good grass-fed lamb is going to smell and taste like those branched-chain fatty acids, and it, it is a particular lamb taste. Uh, most grain, you know, New Zealand lamb, Icelandic lamb, Australian lamb, that all tastes like grass and like these branched-chain fatty acids. American lamb is all, you know, I mean, Anderson Ranch, any of those other guys, you know, you get, it's it's all grain-fed, grain-finished Packing on the fat, not great marbling, just just huge fat caps, and it it tastes extremely mild because people want their red meat all to taste like corn fed beef, and that's what the American market asks for. But you know, I, I really urge people to think about the difference between grass and grain, and grass fed lamb and grass fed beef, and all these different flavors, and then venison and elk and the gaminess, and, and maybe sit down and have a taste test with you and your friends, a, a, a red meat night, and taste the differences between these things. And and you'll really be able to pinpoint that gamey does not taste grassy and mutton doesn't taste like beef or gamey uh, red meats. They're all very, very different. Another reason why I like grass over grain, I'm, you know, food is medicine to me. I, I think that some people might call me kind of a hippie, but I'm really not. I just really want to live for a long time. And I feel the grass fed red meat is, is one way to help with uh, having better health. And there's a few reasons there. Um, Like I mentioned before, the omega-3 fatty acids are a much better ratio to omega-6s. You always want your omega-3s to be higher than your omega-6s. Conjugated linoleic acid, that's another fatty acid that's in grass-fed beef uh, and grass-fed lamb that is is not really found in grain-fed red meat at least not nearly in the quantities that it is in grass-fed. And uh, that's been linked to uh, halting cancer growth, to reducing inflammation, to reducing high blood pressure, to reducing high cholesterol. If anybody knows me, they know that I have high blood pressure and I'm kind of high-strung sometimes. Anything that I can eliminate from my diet that will help with that, I definitely do. Uh, The grass-fed beef is always higher in vitamin A and beta-carotene, vitamin E, vitamin B, the electrolytic minerals. I, I think that's about it. But th- all of these things for me are, are huge benefits. You know, I, I don't really go to the doctor. I don't really take medicine. Uh, my diet is the way that I stay healthy. And so that's kind of what I'm looking for. And that kind of brings me to my next question um, because that's how I raise my animals. Uh, grass-fed lamb is, and, and sheep is kind of that's my specialty and my special interest. I've had the extreme fortune of working with some really, with, with some really brilliant people, uh, especially my friend Jeff out in Washington. He's a really brilliant, brilliant uh, 
sheep rancher and he's has I don't think I've ever had better lamb anywhere in the US. I got a question from Corey on Facebook, and we do have a Facebook group now. Check that out. Um, that'll be up, or is up currently. Uh, he wanted to ask me about farmsteading in general, because I'm, I'm part of a couple groups on there having to do with homesteading and farmsteading and, and sustainable uh, living culture and, and just being self-sufficient in general. I guess that's really that's really my interest is, you know, I'd like to have a closed-loop system of self-sufficiency on my farm someday. Corey asked me about, you know, how, what are the benefits of raising your own meat? Do you enjoy it? How do I get started? And I'd like to talk about farm studying techniques uh, throughout the podcast in little bits because we could go on at great, great lengths on the subject. Um, but today I'll talk a little bit about rotational grazing, sheep, chickens, uh, ducks, beef. Um, here on the farm where I live and work, that is run with my partner, Sarah. Um, she takes, she runs the vegetable program and I'm in charge of the livestock program. And what we raise here is we raise uh, grass fed certified organic lamb. We raise them for meat and for wool. And we raise, um, we have a flock of about 160 laying hens. that are also rotationally grazing. We've got, a small flock of ducks, some geese. Um, the ducks are for laying only, and the geese are kind of guard animals for our ducks because the ducks have virtually no way to protect themselves whatsoever. When it comes to the sheep, though, my good friend Jeff kind of explained raising great grass-fed sheep to me once as, uh, be, you know, if you're, if you're a sheep rancher, what you really are is a grass farmer. And that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, essentially what I'm trying to do by raising my own meat, raising my own sheep, is capture sunlight through the medium of grass. I grow grass. I use sheep to take the energy from the grass, which I got from the sunlight, to convert into meat and into wool. So I have one line of genetics that's specifically for wool, and then I've got another three-step system um, where I'm trying to select for traits that work well in my particular part of Michigan. Uh, and those those are my meat breeds. Uh, I chose. Sh- I, I love beef. I, I love working with beef, um, but for me, I think that sheep really fit our system here a lot better. They're a lot easier to handle. Um, they're excellent foragers, and their conversion of sunlight essentially to wool and meat is is uh, very vigorous and efficient as compared with beef. I feel nutrition wise. Grass-fed lamb is superior to the other red meats uh, due to its fatty acid contents and, and various mineral proficiencies. Uh, and they take care of the land for me. They're, they're great foragers, and they fertilize the land as I rotate them. So, you know, I've basically done some research and had some great suggestions from my dear friends and about how, what to plant in my pasture. Um, we're working on raising the best pasture we possibly can with the best food for our sheep. And from there, they'll take care of the pasture. So if I feed them on that pasture, they're going to take those nutrients that they get and they're going to recycle them back through the pasture. I'd say one of the major advantages of a rotational grazing system is it allows, there's a certain allowance of the land and forages to rest and accumulate their growth after they've been defoliated through the grazing um, without the risk of the animals coming back and grazing them again before they have the opportunity to regrow and replenish the nutrient stores. So they come in, I give them, you know, three days to take the first three bites off of their particular paddock, and then I move them. They don't get to eat the grass all the way down because, A, I want to stay ahead of the parasite cycle, and, B, um, I want to keep my grass healthy and in its vegetative state. And if you graze it too low, then you're, then you're not going to have a good regrowth. And, uh, you know, because the animals are in a smaller area of concentration than, say, like a, a wide open range continuously grazed system, uh, the manure is distributed more evenly across the grazing area and carrying capacity of that paddock is increased because the animals are kind of forced to utilize more of the available forage and waste less. So generally when I move the sheep into a new paddock, you know, they're going for the alfalfa, uh, the clover, the other legumes first, the dandelions, and then they're going to move on to the grasses that they like. And, and at the very end, they're going to go to the fescue or the bluegrass or whatever garbage is left. And, um, 
I try to move them before they get to that, but it's a really great way of grazing down things in your pasture, especially if you're trying to change what's in your pasture, the, what's available to the animals. You let them graze the unwanted stuff down, and then you seed afterwards, and it'll, it gives those new seeds a chance to compete. I found that as the carrying capacity of the paddock of the pasture itself increases, so does the productivity of that area of land. And, um, you know, so the, the more, the more animals that that land can harvest or that that land can support, uh, the better the product is that, that comes off of it. So aside from, you know, feeding us and our friends and family, you know, we, we do sell our, our meat. And one of the reasons why that's really attractive to me is because being a butcher, um, I like to I want to be able to process my own animals. And the majority of our economy here on the farm is done through our, we have a 50 family CSA, two local farmers markets, and a small farm store on our farm that um, is in operation on CSA pickup days. Now, my plan kind of for the future is, and things are moving in that direction very rapidly, is to have an on-farm processing facility where I can go, probably won't start out with killing just because of, as we all know, the logistics that that involves are are extensive. So what I would do is go uh, to my other job where I work at the slaughterhouse, have my animals killed, have them cooled, and then I pick them up, bring them home, and then I can cut them. Now, Michigan state law says that if I cut my animals at home, when they came you know, in, a, in, a, in an inspected kitchen that I've built on my property, if the carcass is coming from a USDA facility, the Michigan law reads that I may sell that meat at the, you know, direct to consumer, not for resale. I could sell it in my own farm store on my property. I can sell them through my CSA to my customers, and I can sell it at the farmer's market. And ultimately for the size operation that I have, you know, I, for a, a smaller homesteader size herd, you know, less than 50 lambing ewes, I think that really that's kind of the ideal situation. You know, you you don't have enough product to be stocking a grocery store or a butcher shop. You've, and it's it's enough product to, to hustle on your own and direct to consumer sales or farmer's market sales. Um, you know, if you want to do resale in a store or sell to a restaurant, do any wholesale like that, you've got to have a bug on it. It has to be processed in USDA. Um, but I find that when I, when I can process my own animals, I can change the cut sheet based on the body condition of the animal as opposed to just putting in my cutting instructions and I get what I get. I've got the control over that butchery. I can re-merchandise that animal any way that I need to to get the maximum value from it. And, you know, honestly, I'm a big proponent of direct-to-consumer sales. While if we didn't have the major processing facilities that we do, the world would starve. That being said, I think that the more people that can be involved in food processing, in knowing where their product comes from, if they have the time for that luxury, I'd like to be there to be a part of that and to provide that service. You know, when I was growing up, a lot of people that I knew buy a quarter beef from so-and-so down the road that raised them. That's what a lot of our business is, uh, is just selling halves and quarters, um, what I like to do is I like to offer sixteenths of a beef. I like to order uh, offer quarters of a hog and halves of a sheep or a lamb because I find that that's a little bit more manageable for a modern couple or a small family. Not everybody has the chest freezer space for a, a half a beef these days, and people really don't cook at home quite as much, you know. So I'm trying to figure out how to evolve the direct to consumer um, meat trade as eating habits evolve into 2017 and beyond. Good job, David on answering those questions. Just wanted to say, I actually like the taste of uh, corn-fed beef, corn-finished beef. I also like the taste of grass-fed beef. I appreciate both. I mostly eat grass-fed beef uh, because of health reasons, and I don't do most of the shopping. 
and if I were to buy some from a small farm, it would be grass fed. Talking about processing on uh, your own property, I run a uh, commercial kitchen at my house. It's part of my basement, and I'm allowed to sell a single ingredient item to places like restaurants. And a steak is a single ingredient item. I can process out of my house and sell to a restaurant. And it may be the case where you live as well, if that's something you're interested in. Now, I could also make sausage and sell it at a farmer's market, it being a multi-ingredient, because my kitchen in my basement is approved by the health department. But I can't sell to a or someplace that is going to resell. The idea is that I'm dealing straight with the consumer, like David said earlier. But the one difference in the state of Washington and many other states, single ingredient items could go to restaurants from uh, a custom exempt non-USDA processing facility if it is improved by their local health department. And in the future, I'd like to do a whole episode where we go into what that looks like. Not so much the permits and shit you need, what I feel, what people are allowed to do and what people should be allowed to do, you know. I mostly use my kitchen for processing stuff for myself and small custom exempt farms, but the possibilities are endless and I feel minimal involvement by the federal government is ideal. All right, getting to the meat of the thing. A lot of people ask me what they could do to support the show. Well, number one thing that you could do to support the show is go to iTunes and like and review. Give us five stars leave a comment comments are going to move us up in the ratings and that's the best thing to do right now to help us uh right now we are ranked number 65 in the food category don't know if that's good but please tell a friend let's maybe uh shoot for 64 next time uh baby steps but tell a friend if you love meat you want to hear meat you don't want it in your mouth you want it in your ears tell everyone spread the word about the meat block and if you have any questions, we would love to answer them. We love doing Q&As. We love all you guys, and we love all the feedback. And Memorial Day is right around the corner, which means it's time to spark up that grill, and we want to hear what you are cooking. Is it on a stick, or is it on the grill? What is it? And to contact us, uh, Instagram at the Meat Block, Twitter at the Meat Block Pod, or you can email us at the Meat Block Podcast at gmail.com. You can find me, at American Butcher on Instagram, or you could tweet me at USA Butcher. You can find David at A Farm Butcher. All that is in the show notes as well as links to our Facebook page. And finally, the outro song you are listening to is Robert Earl King, Old Life in New Mexico. And remember, keep your knife sharp and live in the margin. Yeah. 